Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and also a co-organizer for the workshop New Directions for Quantum Dynamics in Topological, Disordered, and Correlated Systems. As with the other workshops this summer, we had an exciting program planned, but unfortunately, in the face of the pandemic, we couldn't carry it through. We can, however, share some of the new physics that our speakers were planning to bring and broaden our reach in the Zoom format to each of you here together as an international community. And it's really great to see so many of you here today. New to this year, the colloquia will be posted on YouTube at Aspen Physics, and you're invited to share this talk with your students and colleagues. The center is also hosting public lectures on Thursday at 5.30 Aspen time, which we also welcome you to join. This Thursday, Rama Ranganathan will be speaking on the evolutionary design of protein machines. Now for today's highlight, I'm delighted you need to unmute yourself. Can you not hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. Ah, okay. I can hear you. Wonderful, thank you. So I will keep going. So coming to today's highlight, I'm delighted to introduce my colleague from Urbana-Champaign, uh, Professor Taylor Hughes. Taylor earned his PhD in 2009 at Stanford University in the subfield of condensed matter physics, working with the group of Shusheng Zhang. There he'd already begun his pioneering research in topological systems, including the prediction of, the, of a quantum spin halt state in, in a now widely studied heterostructure. He then joined our condensed matter theory group as a postdoc with Eduardo Fradkin. And two years later, we were elated that he remained with us as faculty. Taylor really has an impressive range of research, um, including studies in topological phases, quantum information and entanglement, mesoscopic transport, and connections between high energy and gravity and condensed matter. I find that his approaches fluidly move between mathematical rigor, computation, beautiful direct connections with experiment. And he's also a marvelous colleague and collaborator to be with on a day-to-day -day basis. So now coming to his talk, as it's only 30 minutes long and uh, we started a little late, we won't have any questions in between. You can raise your hand, so to speak, by clicking on that icon at the bottom of the Zoom, Zoom screen. And we'll call on your name during the uh, Q&A session and we'll try our best to do it in order of raised hands. Um, since the talk is being recorded, if you'd rather not be on video, you can of course always um, uh, turn that off. And now, Taylor on higher order topological phases of matter. So on to you, Taylor. Great, thanks, Samantha, for the nice introduction. Thanks to the Aspen Committee for having me uh, give a colloquium. I sure miss being in Colorado this time of year, but at least this is a uh, nice thing to do. Um, today, I'm going to talk about some new research in condensed matter physics, but since it's very hard to judge the composition of this audience because it's so broad and because it's also remote, um, I decided to kind of start off my talk with kind of an introduction to some ideas um, uh, that uh, we use in condensed matter physics, as well as the idea of the basics of topological um, aspects of condensed matter physics, so that we're all on the same page, before I move on to talk about some um, aspects of some newer research that I've been involved with. So the kind of thing that drew me into condensed matter physics is not actually the connection to applications and experiment. It's actually kind of this line that actually that my PhD advisor said that uh, one really nice way to think about condensed matter physics is this uh, line from a poem by William Blake, which is to see the world in a grain of sand. This is quite a you know, romantic statement. The fact that sort of every new material we have um, made up of um, you know atoms and ions, electrons can be its own little universe. Um, unfortunately, many of those universes are very boring, but many of them also have quite interesting features. And so, for example, you can see all these kind of buzzwords of items that um, uh, here are chiral fermions, myron fermions, black holes, and kinetic matter physics um, has analogs of all these types of systems that you can measure in tabletop experiments. So the first thing this should tell you about condensed matter physicists is that we have a uh, high energy envy, right? So all these aspects here are things that appeared uh, in the high energy literature first. Um, and we have been sort of seeking after them in tabletop experiments, right? And the kind of piece that goes along with all of this is that um, the statement by Phil Anderson, which is that more is different. So the idea is that all these phenomena, these, these sort of various phenomena I've listed here, 
um, all can be seen in solids, which are simply collections of interacting electrons and atoms. And uh, that's the microscopic building blocks of all of them. And when you get all of them together, it turns out you can get collective behavior, which mimics some of these phenomena at different energy scales than you might find in fundamental physics. And so while we don't really have the fundamental aspects of the standard model, we have um, what we lose in fundamental, we sort of gain in variety because every new material, as I said, can have, offer some interesting features. So the idea of Moore's difference is actually quite subtle. So if I try to explain at a party what a condensed matter physicist does, it's really difficult, I think. So people ask what is condensed. And so it's kind of uh, a difficult challenge because I can't say that I work with the smallest things in the universe, like the fundamental particles. And I can't say I work with the biggest things in the universe, like the universe itself or black holes. And so I'm somewhere in the middle. And as we all know, if you're in the middle, it's much more complicated. When you have lots of things competing and things interacting, that's the difficult part. And so we have to sort of hope for some um, helpful things and the idea is that more is different. So let me give a simple classical example of this. Imagine that there was only a single car in the entire world. So if we only have one car in the entire world, it can travel freely, it can go over the roads, it can go over the hills, doesn't really matter. And even if I have many cars on the road, if they don't interact with each other, if they don't have to pay car insurance, if they don't have to, you know, they can't collide, they still don't care about each other. They will just pass through each other and easily travel. And it's only when you start having to pay car insurance and worry about traffic rules that you can get collective emergent phenomena, right? So if you get many cars which have to interact, you can get physics like a traffic jam. And so the, the cars are following some set of rules. And if I zoom out from this picture, like this helicopter view, you'll see things that look like a fluid flowing. But if I zoom in microscopically, everything's made up of the same fundamental particles in this case, which are cars. It's just when you get a lot of them together, they don't behave like a free particle moving around on the roads in this case, right? So it goes even deeper than that, for example, in this idea of emergence. So the idea of emergence is that, or one idea of it, is that at small length scales, everything is made up of the same stuff. And at longer length scales, patterns can emerge from the correlations between microscopic things. And the question is, what does longer mean? At what longer scale are we talking about? And this is a variable thing, which is why it's a bit subtle, because longer scale depends on how you're measuring it. Like if we're measuring it with our eye, that's some scale. If we're measuring it with some kind of advanced particle collider or some kind of x-ray device, you know, longer scales can be very different. And so this idea of emergence actually depends on how you're measuring it, right? Which is kind of a fundamental, I think, concept of also the normalization group. So here's a picture of some black and blue dots. And here's a second picture here. And you can clearly tell on the left that there are some correlations because if I pick a black dot in this nucleated droplet here, its neighbors are much more likely to be black than blue. And if I look outside in this blue region, the neighbors of a blue dot here are much more likely to be blue than black. On the right side, this is sort of white noise. So if I pick a black dot, there's some distribution, some random distribution of probability that the neighbors will be black or um, uh, blue. And you can already tell by eye that the left picture has some kind of pattern. You can see some, some correlation here. And that's because the left picture came from sort of a zoomed out in, or zoomed in image of some um, um, filtered picture. And the right hand side came from processed white noise in this case. And so I sort of selected a little tiny picture here. But even on the sort of small scale, you can see that the patterns in this case give you these clear correlations and the information emerges from how those things come out in this case, right? So, you know, these are sort of patterns of dots. It turns out you can also have these sort of classical pictures where you have this sort of pointillist idea where everything is made up of tiny brush strokes and you zoom out and you can kind of see the picture. But it turns out everything digital is emergent, right? Everything digital is built up of little tiny pixels or little tiny bits. And you don't really see the information until you kind of see the um, patterns emerging and the correlations in this case. So your computer, if you look really closely, or if you have an old CRT television screen, you could look really closely and see the little red, green, and blue lights. And uh, you don't really notice that the picture information is getting into you zoom out or step back. And these are things you're measuring with our, with our eye in this case. So these are kind of some fundamental tenets of the philosophy of kinetic physics. And so I want to sort of see how topology gets integrated with this, right? So why topology? Why has topology become such an important concept in the last few decades in condensed matter physics, at least? And part of it's because condensed matter physics is really challenging, okay? And so topology is a coarse property of the system. And the, the nice thing is that sometimes these properties are useful. Sometimes they're not useful. Sometimes they're very mundane or boring, but sometimes these topological properties are useful, right? So if I show you these three shapes, you know, geometry can tell the difference between the shapes. It can tell you about lengths and angles and sides, and topology cannot. Topology would tell you that each one of these is a connected line, and they're continuously connected, right? And that's all it would tell you. Uh, but geometry is detail dependent, right? But the idea of topology is that the reason we care about it, and at least I care about it in kinetic matter physics, is actually quite pragmatic, right? The idea is that for topological properties, for the theorist, 
it means the phenomena I predict don't require my model to be perfect to actually match experiment, right? And for the experimentalist, it means the phenomena I'm looking for don't require my sample to be perfect, don't require my material to be perfect to observe these things. And it kind of has this nice benefit where it allows for really efficient collaborations between theorists and experiment because you can have this nice feedback loop where you sort of can refine the model a little bit, refine the um, material a little bit, and you can make discoveries quite quickly because it doesn't depend on a lot of the details in the system, right? And so this is kind of a pragmatic view of why I think topology has um, uh, arisen as a very um, uh, useful uh, feature in many kinetic matter systems, uh, because it doesn't require perfect microscopic modeling to get something that matches experiment, right? So before we get to topological phases of matter, I want to talk about some simp simple quantum phases of matter, right? So let's think about some what are called magnetic phases or magnetic phases of matter. Many of you have probably have played with magnets before. And so a typical bar magnet is kind of represented by um, some local magnetic moments in the system which are arranged and have um, uh, arrows pointing the same way. So the little magnetic moments are all, all pointing the same way or at least have some correlations to point the same direction. And so in the ferromagnet, the little spins here, the little magnetic moments follow a rule, which is they point the same way as their neighbors. And that sort of, sort of forms this, this phase of matter. For an antiferromagnet, there's still, it's not completely random. You still have this sort of correlation where if I have a spin or a magnetic moment, its neighbor is more likely to point down than up. Um, and so, or the opposite direction at least. And so it follows a rule which is point the opposite way as the neighbors. You can also have crystals which are phases of matter. And the rule that the little atoms follow in this case is they want to get close, but not too close to the neighbors, right? And what sets these rules are the Hamiltonian of your system. The Hamiltonian of the system is what's setting these rules which um, can cause these phases of matter to appear um, in some temperature regimes in this case. Right? So how can we tell that these rules are being followed? Well, what you can do is you can look for some local probes, and this is the idea of symmetry breaking. So I have some local measurements, say the magnetization represented by this box, and then I drag it around and I ask, are my neighbors likely to be pointing the same direction or are they equally likely pointing up and down? And this can tell me whether the symmetry is broken or not. The same thing in the crystal, I can sort of look at the local density. I can take a measurement of the local density or something um, related to that. And you can tell whether or not the system has broken tra continuous translation symmetry because in some regions, you'll more likely find a blue atom than a red atom. And that means these points in space are different than other points in space, right? So typically, the idea is that local measurements and correlations can tell you that the symmetry is broken. And they're characterized by some function, which is how you, you uh, in this case, some local order parameter, which allows you to determine the magnetization or density in the system as a function of position. So then you can imagine restoring the symmetry by heating up these things or melting these phases, for example. So you can imagine heating up the, um, the system so that the spins become random, entropy starts to take over, and you get something called a paramagnet, which colloquially can be thought of as like a liquid of spins. You can imagine taking your um, um, actual solid and applying um, some heat to that and seeing that that will melt and you, so then you'll get sort of translation symmetry kind of restored in this case. And so then you end up with something which doesn't have a broken symmetry and looks kind of featureless, right? So suppose we have the following thought experiment. So I want to take two um, liquids at say low temperature, zero temperature, uh, and I want to do all the measurements I can. Suppose they look featureless and I want to ask are these liquids the same or different? And so we can measure. So we can look at all the local measurements I can think of. And suppose they're not magnetic. Suppose they don't have electric polarization. Uh, they're not superfluids. They're not liquid crystals. And so you can, suppose you do any local measurement you can think of, and you can't find any correlations which tell you a symmetry is broken. And so now you can ask the question again, OK, are these liquids the same, or are they different? Are they the same phase of matter or not? And it turns out that they don't always have to be the same. Even when all local measurements you could do in a lab, even thought experiments, yield the same result, meaning that they're featureless you can still have a type of quantum order, which um, uh, is called topological order in this case. And so this is a type of hidden quantum order. And so we can't see it easily through local measurements. And so we can ask, how do we find it, right? So it turns out if we want to look for topological order, uh, the first place we have to look is in two dimensional systems. So liquids in two dimensions, for example. Um, there's no real topological order systems in one dimension. And so these type of topological order systems are strange quantum liquids, and they have the property that if you change the topology of the space on which the liquid lives, in which it resides, the number of quantum ground states changes. Okay, so before we get to this, let's think about possible types of two-dimensional topology. So, the, so for closed manifolds in 2D, the topology has been classified by the genus, and so you can think about having a plane, um, or a disk in this case, or a sphere, or a donut, or double handle, or triple handle um, manifolds. And these are each labeled by this, this number G, which is an integer number indicating the genus of the manifold. 
And so it turns out that if you have a two-dimensional liquid with topological order and you change the topology in the space, you change the genus, the number of ground states changes. So you could have a system where you give a liquid on a plane that has one ground state. If you put it on a sphere, it still has one ground state, it's unique. But if you put it on a donut, it might, for example, have four ground states. And so you can sort of typify this type of thing by saying that um, a heuristic definition of topological order is that if the number of ground states depends on the spatial topology, then the system has topological order. And so the way to quantify this is you can have the number of ground states n is equal to some integer raised to the genus in this case. So in this case, for this particular liquid I've written here as an example, in this case, the number lambda will be four. And so if I, if I increase the genus even further, the number of ground states will grow in this kind of interesting exponential fashion. Okay. So if you've never had any experience with this, maybe this seems reasonable, maybe you haven't studied this type of thing before, but it's actually quite unusual, right? Because topology knows nothing about size. It knows only about how the space is connected on some global scale, right? So imagine a liquid lives on a huge torus, how would it distinguish that torus from a plane, right? Because locally they are identical. They're flat. Uh, you can sort of, you know, Euclidianize the torus, it looks flat in this case. Uh, and so physics actually is local for the most part, right? So we have this idea that, you know, if I want to figure out if I'm living on a, on a um, plane or a donut, I drop uh, a pebble in the liquid and I have to wait for the waves to go all the way around the system then when the waves hit the boundary, they will either reflect back if it's a plane or they'll keep going in periodic boundary conditions and interact with each other. So I have to wait a long time if this torus is big, right? I address some characteristic velocity of my liquid excitations and I have to wait uh, for that to happen, right? And so the idea is that this, because physics, as we know, it is basically local, right? We have some local perturbations and the effects of that spread as a function of time. But topology doesn't understand this. Topology is not sensitive to this type of distance scale, right? And so the idea is that, you know, I can imagine this following experiment. Suppose I start with my liquid on a plane, and then I glue the top and bottom together to have a cylinder. Okay, the number of ground states doesn't change. But now I can glue the sides of the cylinder together to make a donut. And all of a sudden, the number of ground states jumps from one to four, right? And even if this donut is quite big, then in principle, <clears throat> the system knows that it's been glued together because the number of ground states is different, right? And so we can ask, how does this happen? How does this sort of non-local feature happen? Well, one important feature is that it turns out for topological systems, the boundaries, the edges of the system have unusual properties already. But this idea that the ground state can change in this way actually comes from the fact that you have this um, quantum entanglement. So it turns out that topological quantum liquids are typically highly entangled over long ranges, right? The idea is that if I cut my system in half, <clears throat> I can ask how much does system A know about system B or how much is system A affected by measurements in system B and if the system is highly entangled then it knows a lot and so you have some non-local information in this case and so these quantum liquids which are topologically ordered have this sort of feature that um, they have long-range entanglement built in so when I glue the system together the entanglement reacts and the number of quantum ground states can be modified in that case okay so the idea is that quantum entanglement is a key feature of these type of topologically ordered systems, right? And just as a reminder as about quantum entanglement, right? You can imagine having two spins and I can ask, can I write the ground state of these uh, spins as a tensor product of what's happening in A times, a, times uh, what's happening in B. If I give you some quantum state like this, it turns out you can write it as a product of A and B. And so then the measurements in B and A are independent of each other. Uh, conversely, I can also have a um, singlet state, for example, which is the characteristic, you know, paradigm entangled state. And now if I write the state, it doesn't, can't be written as a tensor product, it can be written as a sum of tensor products. And in this case, uh, the coefficients here, one over square root of two, one over square root of two, determine what's called the entanglement entropy, which is a measure of how much the system is entangled. So this is some kind of entangled state. And these quantum liquids have a lot of entanglement. So it turns out these quantum liquids have a lot of entanglement, but most of it is coming from the interface, right? So most systems, it turns out, if they have short range correlations, for example, gapped systems, where the, the excitations have an energy gap, uh, most systems actually have a lot of entanglement coming right where you cut the system because these things are really coupled strongly, like A and B are not completely decoupled. And so a lot of the entanglement comes from the interface between them. And this is called the area law entanglement, okay? Um, and so it turns out these topological liquids have this area law component. Um, uh, coming from the entangled degrees of freedom on the interface. But it turns out they actually have a constraint which re reduces the entanglement entropy by an amount gamma called the topological entanglement entropy. 
Now, this amount gamma may seem like a, you know, a um, small thing, but it turns out if I deform the system even quite violently, as long as I don't destroy the topological order, this amount gamma stays quantized and fixed in these topological liquids. So actually it's some kind of um, what's called a topological invariant, some fixed number, which can characterize something about the quantum liquid. And so that it turns out we can use this number gamma, this sort of deviation of the entanglement entropy of these quantum liquids from the area law to make a rough uh, classification of topological phases in this case, right? So it's not perfect, but it's a rough classification. So it turns out that the number of ground states, this number lambda I wrote, which characterizes the ground state degeneracy, depends in a key way on this um, uh, entanglement entropy. I can write this number lambda as the exponential of two times this entanglement entropy factor. And so many systems called, for example, topological insulators, which have become quite um, uh, prominent in the last decade, don't have topological entanglement entropy. So there are systems which are called topological, but which we'd say are not topologically ordered. They have some topological features. Oftentimes, instead of being completely um, deformation independent, they require you to have a symmetry. And there's many material examples of these. There's the integer quantum Hall effect, the quantum spin Hall effect, three-dimensional topological insulators, topological crystal insulators, and quantum anomalous Hall effect. These are all different pictures of the different materials in which you can find these, and they don't have topological entanglement entropy. And so they have entanglement patterns which are interesting, but they don't have this really, really ultra long range entanglement. Then there's the more commonly understood what's called the abelian fractional quantum Hall effect systems. These are um, the sort of most well-known fractional quantum Hall effect that um, uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize in the 1980s. And these can be found, for example, in gallium arsenide and graphene. And these have some non-zero gamma, and it depends on the type of fractional quantum Hall state you have. And it turns out there's actually even a more exotic set of states where the number of ground states is bound by this number, but it's not exactly equal. And these are called non-abelian fractional quantum Hall states, for which I'll go into in a minute. And we have some characteristic systems where these might be found, but um, uh, there's actually no, I think, really strong, um, really concrete evidence that these might occur outside of some interesting experiments in the quantum Hall effect system. So um, these are sort of still an open area of research, um, and there's even more places you might find these type of interesting non-abelian states. But it turns out that for actually interesting applications, physical applications, for example, in quantum computing, these non-abelian ones, which I said we haven't completely understood yet experimentally, are the actual um, most interesting ones. So how do we understand this? So first of all, what does it mean by abelian and non-abelian? Well, this has to come, this comes from the idea of um, uh, the exchange statistics of the excitations in the liquid. So these type of topological liquids have interesting excitations. Uh, these excitations go by the name anions, and you can think of just as excitations which are like vortices in the fluid. And here's some numerical um, data showing these pictures of some excitations in a topological fluid. And the idea is if I take two of these excitations and I exchange them, then we can ask what happens. Well, if it's just a boson or fermion, we know what happens. You get a phase of plus or minus one, uh, which I can sort of label as the group Z2. Um, in a brilliant insight by Wolchek in the 1980s, he said, well, what if we take this group Z2 and extend it to U1? So you can have what are called abelian anions coming from the fact that the these phases in the U1 group also commute with each other. And in this case, when I exchange them, instead of picking up a plus or minus sign, I can pick up some complex phase. And this is some extension of the idea of statistics, which can appear in two plus one space-time dimensions, okay? The idea of non-abelian is we can go beyond U1, and now maybe we extend it to a, a, a matrix group, like SU2, for example, some kind of lead group. And in this case, you can have what are called non-abelian anions, where instead of picking up a you know, U1 phase factor, you pick up a matrix, matrix phase factor, right? But the question is, what is this matrix acting on? What is the space on which this matrix is acting, right? Because here I just have some particle coordinates. There's no, it's no seemingly state space. And so this is where this idea of trying to generate what's called topological quantum computation comes about, because this state space, it turns out, is very interesting. So the idea is you can get what are called topological qubits if you have these non abelian anions. Each anion has some local degrees of freedom, like its position and its internal quantum numbers, like maybe its spin. But each non-abelian anion contributes to a global state space associated with the entire global set of anions. And so it turns out that in the simplest type of non-abelian system, if you stack up, if you have two of these non-abelian excitations, you get enough um, uh, states to, to fill out one uh, qubit, so two, a two-state system. If you have four, you'll get two qubits. If you have a bunch of them, 
you have some global state space now, which may build up in an exponential way, some set of two, bit, um, two state systems in this case. And so it turns out that one of the simplest non-abelian systems has what's called a quantum dimension of square root of two, because I have if I have two anions, I get two states. So each anion by itself has this weird irrational um, Hilbert space you know, um, um, identifier. But if you have um, a multiple of them, many of them, you can build up some quantum state space. And now you can ask, you can try to do some kind of quantum operations, right? But the, the feature of this, of this global state space is that if I have some kind of error, right, introduced by maybe a photon hitting this bit or some kind of um, fluctuation, thermal fluctuation, then it actually doesn't affect the global state space if it only hits one or some well-separated modes. You have to sort of have a correlated error where you hit two of these things at once, which is actually very rare. And so it turns out to flip a bit, you actually have to have some kind of long range correlated um, a noise, for example, which is very rare in nature, or these bits have to be so close to each other that a single fluctuation hits both of them. So if you sort of well separate these anions, it turns out you can generate a quantum state space, which is very robust from errors in this case. And this is sort of the basis under which the idea of topological quantum computation is founded. And this has sort of been very popular in the Kinn spanner world because it's a possible application of these topological liquids. Um, and this is sort of a beautiful picture from Scientific American, which shows the idea that if you start moving these, these vortices around, it turns out that exchanging them has the matrix, this, this statistics matrix acts on the state space. And so if I move the vortices around in some way through what's called braiding, you can actually do quantum operations on this global state space in this case. And so the idea is that each one of these anions does not contain the quantum information but it kind of contributes to a global state space that's sort of well protected from errors in this case. Okay, so that was sort of the introduction I had in mind for the idea of condensed matter and topological order. I now want to go back to these systems which are called topological insulators, which have some entanglement but don't have this ultra long range entanglement which gives rise to the uh, topology dependent ground states. So one reason these are so, I think, have become so prominent in the last decade is because now there are a plethora of them that have been discovered in nature. There are many material types which can exhibit different types of topological insulators. And the idea of a topological insulator is that the bulk is insulating. You can think about the bulk has an energy gap, so it doesn't conduct electricity very easily. Uh, but the surface has some low energy modes on it. The surface has some low energy states. And those states, it turns out, are not just um, arbitrary states doing, due to the details of the surface, but they're actually due to some properties of the bulk topology. And so in recent years, uh, in the past two or three years, it turns out that it's now been realized that there's an interesting hierarchy of topological insulators called higher order topological insulators. And the idea there is you can have these gray regions, which are the gapped interiors, and a typical first order topological insulator will have a surface state, whereas a higher order one might have low energy modes on the hinges, but a gap in the surface. Or you could even have modes where the surface and hinges are gapped, but the corners have these localized low energy modes. And so the topology now is now built on these interesting features on higher co-dimension submanifolds of a, um, of a system in this case. Okay. So just as a reminder for those of you um, who may not know, the idea of a first order topological insulator, this is an example of a 1D system, you have a gapped bulk and you have some kind of low energy modes, in this case, these sort of zero energy end states. If I have a two dimensional system, I'll have some edge states and a canonical example of this is what's called the uh, chiral edge states. So you have like a one way channel on the boundary, which will circulate around the edge. Uh, given some symmetries, you could also have edge states which have counter-propagating things which are protected. But the idea is that the interior is gapped and has some topological property. And as I go from the interior to the vacuum or the exterior outside, that topological property has to change, right? It's non-trivial inside the interior and outside there's nothing. So it has to change. And it has to, if, it's gonna, if a topological property changes, it has to do so discontinuously. And so it turns out these edge states are a way to encode this discontinuous change that allows the system to have a topology change from inside to outside. And so typically these edge states are required to transfer or to change transition the topology from inside the material to outside the material. That's kind of the idea, a heuristic idea of why these edge states exist. And you can also have these sort of 3D surface states as well, where you can sort of get gapless cones on different surfaces, for example. And as I said, the gapless boundary states are usually indicative of a change in the topology. Okay. But the idea of higher order is that the actual boundaries are gapped. So if, for example, I take this two-dimensional system, I have a topological system in the interior and a trivial system outside, well, the edge is gapped. And so you can ask, how is the, how is the topology changing from inside to outside? You have a sort of continuous adiabatic path from inside to outside, seemingly in this case, 
So how is this changing, right? And the idea is that it turns out that even though the edge is gapped, the edge itself could be like a one-dimensional topological state in this case, a one, and I, so a one-dimensional topological insulating state. And so if I want to test whether or not the edge itself is a gapped topological system, what I need to do is I need to cut it, right? So I need to cut it across the system to see if a corner has a state, right? So what can happen is that if the gapped edge, for example, is topological instead of being trivial itself, then I can cut it. And when I cut it, what you find is there could be these low energy modes localized on the corners where I've now cut these edges in this case, right? So this is not, this is not the um, mechanism that applies for every type of higher order topological system, but it does apply in some cases. So it's a nice heuristic picture of what's happening. So the idea is that even though there's sort of a gapped interpolation between the interior of the material and the exterior of the material, that gap interpolation doesn't itself have to be trivial. It could have some topological property itself. And we would test that by, again, making a second cut to kind of unveil the sort of states that exist on the corner in this case, right? And so these kind of corner states um, are a bit unusual. So given this type of thing, we can ask, can you find these type of higher order systems in, in nature? And um, these type of systems, I think, were first kind of um, prominently predicted, at least in, in um, 2017 or 2018. And since that time, there hasn't been a lot of um, progress for solid state electronic realizations. There have been some theoretical proposals and a few experiments in three dimensions, but not much in two dimensions. And so it turns out the actual first realizations of these type of high order systems appear in, in classical systems. So either in uh, photonic um, arrays of uh, photonic waveguide arrays or in um, different type of resonator arrays. And the idea is that, you know, these things were predicted for quantum electronic systems but this sort of topological property kind of transcends its quantum origin and can um, uh, appear even in sort of classically uh, classical systems with coupled modes, right? So this, I'll get to that in a second. This kind of uh, table nicely summarizes these type of thing here. So the typical first order topological insiders are what um, have been kind of around for the past few decades. You can have one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional systems with stuff on the edges. Uh, second order systems in 2D have corner states and in 3D will have hinge states. And the third order systems in 3D will have corner states. Um, if we get to the end, I'll tell you how you can go beyond three dimensions um, in tabletop experiments uh, if we have time right at the end. So uh, I need to wrap up in a second anyway. So the idea is that these systems have been observed actually in these metamaterial arrays. So here's a picture um, uh, of an experiment I was involved with. So I'm a theorist, but I, my experimental collaborator, Mikhail Rexman at Penn State has these laser written waveguide arrays, which are actually just coupled modes. And it turns, um, and it turns out you have these systems where you can have um, the distances between the waveguides tunes the system between being sort of a trivial insulator to one which has second order corner states. And uh, I think my videos, yeah, are locked. So for some reason my videos aren't working on the left-hand side and the middle, but the right-hand side is actually the most interesting one because it shows that if you funnel light into a corner, the mode, instead of penetrating into the bulk and decaying, actually just gets locked on the corner here. You have this sort of resonant corner mode. And so it shows you can have these waveguide arrays have these corner states. Um, another beautiful example of this type of experiment was done in two dimensions in three different metamaterial systems. You can have systems built from uh, mechanical plates, which are mechanical um, waveguide, uh, mechanical um, mode coupled uh, arrays. Uh, the middle system here is a system of microwave strip resonator, resonator arrays coupled, and the third one is a case of LC circuit resonators, all done by three different groups around the same time. And it turns out these systems exhibit what's called a topological quadrupole insulator, where you have corner states on a two-dimensional system, and they're all sort of realizing the same type of microscopic lattice model, but with different microscopic, um, different microscopic features here. Um, so the idea is you have these kind of topological <clears throat> uh, properties. So let me see if I can uh, wrap up here. Um, so we're getting close to time. So one more feature I'll say before I end is that it turns out that in these systems of higher order topology and actually topology in general, there's a beautiful connection between this idea of symmetry and defects and topology. And it turns out that different types of symmetry defects like domain walls, vortices, dislocations, et cetera, can produce interesting uh, bound state properties. And it turns out these higher order systems can have interesting bound state properties on what are called disclinations, which are like curvature defects, angular defects in the lattice. And these type of angular defects can be realized in nature again. So these are some examples, again, of these microwave strip resonators where you have these different types of um, uh, disclination defects and you can find interesting localized modes that appear on these type of symmetry effects.
So let me um, stop there since that was my last slide by um, uh, briefly mentioning my collaborators. Um, these are my collaborators on some of the initial ex uh, theoretical and experimental work. So my student, Vladimir Benalcazar, is now at Penn State as a postdoc. Uh, Andre Bernavig, uh, who's a faculty member at Princeton. Um, Gaurav Ball, who's an experimentalist at Illinois. Uh, Mikhail Rexman, experimentalist at Penn State. And there are two grad students, Chris and, um, and Jiho. And then some of my recent, more recent theory collaborators, including four of my students and then um, uh, other uh, UIC, and then also my collaborator, Easy Yo from uh, at Princeton and Fiona Burnell. So I'll stop there and then uh, take any questions people have, and I'll be happy to um, uh, go over or discuss anything else in more detail. Well, thank you, Taylor, so much for that beautiful view of topological um, uh, phases. So we have about 15 minutes for <clears throat> questions. And I think the best way would just be if, um, and Patty, are you there to uh, help with coordinating this? Yes, I can help you. Okay, perfect. So if you, okay, we see some raised hands already. Um, and Patty, I don't know if you can see it in order of who's uh, raising the hand, but um, let me see. So we shall, Patty, do you want to go ahead with unmuting? I see some, quite a few raised hands. Do all the zones. Hello. Yeah, really Hello, I have a question concerning uh, the transitions between higher order topological phases, in particular in the case of disordered systems. Um, so first of all, I'm not even sure whether, since I think crystalline symmetry is important for the definition, whether disorder is actually a good question, but uh, between different higher order topological phases, is there a delocalized state as between quantum Hall states? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, for, for the case of, um, so I think the answer is not known. So there's been some, there's been a little bit of work on disordered higher order systems. Most of the time, unfortunately, as you said, it requires a crystal symmetry to exactly protect it. Uh, you can get around that in some situations by having the symmetry protected on average. Um, but I think that there's very little work done on that. Um, one of the reasons there's very little work is because the higher order sort of only starts really appearing in two dimensions and three dimensions, which are much more difficult to deal with numerically if you disorder the system. Um, I would guess that uh, for systems where the boundaries are really anomalous, like in cases where you have edges which are chiral fermions and things like that, uh, like the hinge states in three dimensions, you would have some kind of delocalized state, at least on the surface, if not in the bulk. For the cases where you have zero dimensional localized modes, it's much less obvious. So for example, in one dimension, right, um, uh, if you just look at a one dimensional topological insulator, then the zero mode topology is carried completely by localized states. And it's only at, right at the transition when you have some kind of delocalized state. In two dimensions, of course, even the occupied states uh, for a turn insulator has this sort of um, turn number. So it, I think it's not clear if the spectrum has to hold a localized state uh, other than at the transition point. But that's an interesting open question, which I think is really, I think, uh, important to understand, especially for three dimensional systems where you have these really anomalous hinge states, which uh, would look more like a turn insulator or a quantum spin hall insulator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Patty, the next person. Rob? Oh, it's, sorry, uh, Sparse? Mm -hmm. when talking about topological qubits that an error can be um, an error can be uh, non-local so I was wondering if you could give an example of that uh, yeah I mean the idea is that typically to to change the bit uh, you need to affect two of these anions at once yeah. and if I'm doing that in a lab that's already kind of difficult enough right if I'm guiding it right if it's a random process just like having, you know, mini body collisions at one time is also difficult. I think it's just less likely. You have to have like a mini body uh, noise type of thing, right? Multiple multi body noise. And if they're far away from each other, I think it's even less likely to be correlated. Okay. If if the two Indians are close to each other, then maybe the same perturbation has a big enough spot size or big enough effective size where you can hit both of them at once. But it's difficult, I think, to have correlated things happening at two points um, in a random way. Um, now, it's not to say it couldn't happen or that there's other things that couldn't happen. I mean, you know, the the kind of topological stability is a, is a blessing and a curse because it also makes it, it makes it hard for nature to interact with it, but it also makes it hard for us to interact with it, right? And so, um, you know, and so I think that um, it, it does somehow, should somehow protect 
for random errors, but there's lots of literature which says that this may be less promising than people thought. There's, you know, so it's not obvious. I think there's a lot of interesting literature talking about the actual practical um, implementation of this. But the idea is that just if, it, if you have two things far away, then a random fluctuation is less likely to interact with both of them at once, I think. Um, if, it, if it happens both of them at once, then it's like either not random or they're too close and you could separate them further maybe in this case. Okay. Mm -hmm. So next, um, <clears throat> Patty. Um, Rob, Kushner. Uh, am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I could hear you. I cannot now. Hmm. Oh, I can't. I can't hear you. I cannot hear you, Rob. Rob, I think you're muted at your end. Let me do it that way then. That's okay. better. Yeah, and I can hear okay. you. Okay. Great. Um, so the ground states typically would correspond to different components, to, to connected components of the configuration space, but often there's higher topology loops, which would be more interesting for dynamics, either transitions or things like that. And that, the first question is whether you've ever tried to develop experiments to detect those loops. I mean, the mathematics gives you the loops, but whether you can see them. And the simple question, which is separate is, you had that parameter gamma, that the sign of that gamma, you had zero, for the topological insulators, but could you comment on whether the sign, one of them seems to switch the entropy in a way that seems interesting from the point of view of physics? So those are the two questions. Okay, so I'm not sure to answer the first ones. The first so the, uh, the um... I mean, I can, yeah. I can amplify it. I mean, often the configuration space will not only have different connected components and you'd find a ground state in each component, but a particular component might also have loops and higher order topology that you might see, for example, a, a closed orbit of in, in time, like a, you'd see a dynamical system where the, you wouldn't just have a, an equilibrium state, but a dynamic state that would loop around in a non-trivial way. Uh, that's what I you, see. Yeah, those, yeah, that's a really interesting question. So, so people have in some cases thought about how you might drive a system dynamically to generate extra topology like in the time direction and there's lots of literature that does that for topological insulators i think less so for the systems with actual topological order but those are interesting questions trying to generate either to space-time topology or having um, some kind of as you said um, sensitivity to the other topological aspects of the manifold in which you're living yeah, uh, there's very so sorry go ahead i said just the high the high order topology it might be loops it might be high dimensional things that would be hard to detect just using you know a time parameter you need a multi-parameter type right thing. yeah that's right because yeah and if you only use time you have one loop that's right so you might need some other parameter space so what i am so i mean one um aspect i was going to write about in this case is topology you know it depends on these some set of parameters that could be space time in anything you want in this case some other continuous parameters you can build in topology um, however you want in this case, right? You can sort of use what's called dimensional exchange or dimensional, you know, synthetic dimensions where you can add extra dimensions by having tunable parameters in the system. Mm -hmm. And this might let you sample higher types of topology other than, as you said, the loops in um, some kind of manifold in this case. And so some topological ordered systems um, in higher dimensions may be sensitive to that. The most well-known and well-studied ones are in two dimensions, so you don't have a lot of topology there. Most of it's not sensitive to the um, two cycles on the torus, only the loops, only the sort of fundamental group in this case, because they're based on some two plus one dimensional gauge theories. Um, now, mm -hmm. there are other more complicated types of field theories that you might write down to write down some kind of topological um, field theory, and those will be sensitive to more interesting topological features beyond just the loops. And there's a whole literature starting in you know gravity as well as in high energy theory, which is now permeated a bit in kinetic matter theory, uh, where people are studying that. So that's an interesting question. Um, can you remind me of your second question? That was the easy one. Gamma. Oh, gamma. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's sign. Right. So, so gamma, so, so the way gamma is defined here, um, in my slide is that gamma is, is, is always positive. So it's a, um, so it's a, it's a, it's a weakening of it's, it's lowering the area law. So the area law is, sorry. Okay. Yep. So gamma defined this way is always positive for these topological ordered systems. And it's because basically there is a, it's coming from a constraint. So basically the idea is that if, if, if all my degrees of freedom were free to fluctuate on the interface, I would just get the area law entanglement. They can just entangle each other. 
But it turns out that there's a constraint from the fact that the ground state of these topological liquids is a gas of loops and they're closed loops. And so it turns out that if I know how many lines of the loops are crossing this interface between them, it turns out there's a constraint because the, um, uh, the loops are closed. And so every loop that passes through has to sort of pass through twice or wrap around in some sense. And so there's some constraint which actually lowers the entanglement entropy. And there's, so there's some heuristic way to think about this coming from a constraint from the sort of loop configurations of the ground state. And so gamma is always positive in this case. And so um, uh, you may have systems where you get more entanglement than the area law. And then the question is whether it's a constant or it scales like to become more not area law, but volume law or something. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I, there may be systems where you might, you might have gamma negative. Those would not be the traditional topological systems where you have this sort of paradigm of these, uh, this extra constraint, which lowers the entropy in this case. Yeah, I was curious if there were ones with negative gamma. Yeah, they, yeah that's a good question. There may be systems which have interesting properties which would have a, subtly encroach the area law, which slightly increases it instead of decreases, that would be interesting to look at, but I don't know of one. Hey, thanks. Sure. Great, I'm seeing the raised hands now. So I think uh, Yigal is next. Let me just, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question about the general relation between the entanglement entropy and the, gen the generosity of the ground state. Okay. Uh, does that assume anything about the boundary conditions? Because I would assume, for example, even non-trivial topological state like the fractional quantum Hall state will be non-degenerate if you have open boundary conditions. Ah, uh, okay. So in all the good. So okay. So um, for this good, great, great question. So if this relationship I'm writing down here, these are all going to be for sort of closed systems characterized by some genus in this case. So I'm thinking like sphere donut, two-handed donut, two-handed donut, this type of thing. So yeah, not definitely not open, because then yeah, the then, then the ground state will be degenerate because you have gapless boundary states in those cases. Mm -hmm. um, okay. so, th so this configuration is purely the relationship when I have no, basically no boundaries. I have a closed compact system. So those sort of pictures I drew, the cartoon pictures of the sphere donut, this type of manifold in that case is when this holds. If I have boundaries, there's a whole other issue with the gapless edge states, which will cause ground state degeneracy or you know, gaplessness in this case. Okay, thanks. Sure. Sorry. Um, I see that Dimitri um, is next. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Taylor, for the interesting talk. I'd like to ask you about the uh, can you comment about the possible applications uh, of the zero corner states? Mm. Corner state? Yeah, so I mean, in if if they appear in electric electrical solid state systems, there I think there are no known applications. So these zero dimensional states, like that, might appear on the boundaries of the you know one D two superheater chain or somewhere else, uh, don't have applications in these cases because they're um, you know just, just they're just localized modes effectively, right? Where they may have applications is actually in these sort of metamaterial photonic systems where having a localized tightly confined mode at a frequency that sits in the gap of some photonic band, um, band structure may actually be useful for light funneling applications or other type of lasing applications. So there are, there are places in the metamaterial systems where these things might actually be, the zero dimensional states might actually be useful. Okay. Now, we can contrast this with the one-dimensional topological superconductors like the Kataev chain, where the boundary states are actually localized Majorana modes, like non and anions. In that case, you might use those zero-dimensional modes for topological qubits. But for the insulator cases and the metamaterials cases, you don't have those type of um, um, connection to the kind of you know, uh, robust state space in that case. Was that, is that what you're asking, or was, it, was there something else? Yeah, yeah. Thank okay. You. Yeah, so I think the zero-dimensional states probably in solid state systems are more of a curiosity. They typically actually indicate that the boundary has some kind of fractional charge, which is interesting fundamentally, but not application-wise. So I think they're interesting for a fundamental reason, but not necessarily um, for application in the solid state systems. Okay, we have <clears throat> time for one or two more questions, and I see um, Alexander has his hand raised. Uh, hello, thank you for the great uh, lecture. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my question is, what's the benefits of topological lasing systems like uh, metamaterials with uh, um, uh, HOTI? Yeah, I mean, so, <laughs> so uh, it's a good question. So I think that um, 
you know, you, you can read the papers that have written that, you can read their, their kind of marketing statements and make your mind, own mind up there. I think that they are interesting possible applications for those things, but yeah, I think it's unknown, right? I think that, um, you know, given any type of resonator system with gain, you can always ask, can I, can I make it laser? And I wasn't involved in the laser experiments, so I don't have an, uh, I'm kind of agnostic about the application in this case, but yeah, I think there are possibly some interesting features. It could be useful, for example, to have a system where the, the inside is, is insulating and the, and the bulk has some, has some, has some accessible lasing modes in this case, or maybe different applications that, or you might have something where, um, so let me give you another example, which maybe is, is, may also be interesting. Suppose I have a system where instead of the corner modes or the boundary modes, I have a disclination defect where my lasing modes are the interior of my system, right? So I have a disclination de defect right at the center. And now that mode is protected by all the other gap stuff outside of it. So I found a way to isolate that interesting maybe mode that I can laser with in the center of my system. So maybe I can have some kind of core laser which is protected from the outside by some kind of other resonator things, right? So there may be interesting applications of these things, but yeah, I don't know if, for example, a higher order topological considered laser is going to be any better performing or any uh, better application than um, the sort of regular applications, right? Um, I think for now, these are sort of, uh, a lot of these things are sort of looking at some sort of fundamental, um, um, you know, physics or proof of concept type of things. And I think the real applications are um, still um, a little bit away, but I think that people, I mean, some of my collaborators and lots of other great scientists are actually really working on not, not just high order TF, but just topological metamaterials and really trying to find honest applications with them, not just kind of like proof of concept type of things. Great. So thank you. We, sure. We have time for, ooh, okay. Two last questions and then we'll have to end. Uh, so um, William, if you could go first and then Noah, and then we can conclude. So we'll um, let's see. So I um, really enjoyed your talk. Um, could you say a few words about um, high order topology and magnetic uh, topological insulators, if there's anything interesting to be found, um, found there? Yeah, so, um, right. So, I mean, certainly the idea of broken time reversal is interesting from the sense that you could look for systems which have um, uh, these chiral hinge states. So um, those are perhaps one of the more exciting time reversal broken higher order TIS you know, on the hinges or places where surfaces of three-dimensional cube intersect or on defects that act like that type of intersection. You can have chiral modes of different types. Um, you could have systems where you have you know, correlated physics where maybe instead of getting a free chiral fermion, you get some kind of interesting other type of chiral mode. Uh, there's also examples, like, and it, I mentioned bri very briefly that the first two-dimensional high order TI example that, that I mentioned here was this quadrupole insulator. You can also have systems which have magnetic quadrupole moments. You can have three-dimensional insulators where instead of having um, electric quadrupole, could have magnetic quadrupole, and you have different circulating currents on the surfaces. Um, and just, I mean, the yeah, so I think there are lots of interesting options. There's also the idea that, you know, um, I, I think, well, I, so I, I think that's what I would say is that, yeah, there's very interesting applications for time reversal broken systems. You can also have different types of what are called higher order topological semi-metals, which have connections to regular wild semi-metals. And again, time reversal breaking is kind of uh, a key feature for the most interesting types of wild semi-metals, which have, you know, anomalous hall effects and things like that. So I think that looking for, um, uh, yeah, magnetic insulators, things like this, uh, there's probably a rich correspondence with actually physically observable phenomena. I think there's probably a nice connection there because most of the interesting physical properties occur in time reversal broken higher order TIs. So I think that is one of the uh, promising aspect of that direction. Is that what you were looking for or something something else? Maybe I misinterpret the question. Um, no, that was exactly what I was looking for. Thank you very much. Okay, sure, yeah, all right, good, thanks. Great, so one last question from Noah. Morning, Taylor. Morning, Smith. Morning. The universe in a grain of sand. <laughs> the late Xu Cheng's uh, very inspiring, um, romantic uh, gesture raises the, maybe a fundamental physics question. We've had now for about 10 years in the lab and now in photonics, uh, which counts as the lab, we have examples of topological insulators, topological order, higher topological insulators. If you had to summarize briefly, what's the upshot for someone uh, obsessed with fundamental physics? You know, someone who was trained in um, supergravity, say. What can you say has been the upshot for them of all these examples in the lab where we can look at the grain of sand and we're, we're so excited to have this uh, talk today and we've learned so much. 
what, do, what for them is the upshot of all this, this um, mucking around with photons and electrons? Yeah, it's a good question. So, so one thing, of course, is to try to have, you know, exhibit some control on things we don't understand. I mean, field theory is field theory, but, you know, until we can measure things, we don't necessarily understand it. Um, yeah, I think having analogs of some things we may not even hope to find in nature, for example, magnetic monopoles, for example, they may not ever be found in nature, but yet we can find them and study them. You know, it brings new life to a lot of the old, these old theories. For example, there are examples of systems which could be super symmetric, you know, in condensed matter systems. So I think it breathes new life into a lot of things that, um, you know, were promising maybe um, in high energy physics, which may or may not pan out to be the theory, uh, the fundamental theory. Also just things like, you know, chiral fermions, myronic fermions, you know, different proposals for neutrinos, things like that, which again, you know, there's only gonna be one fundamental theory, but there's many applications for these type of ideas. So I think having new life for these ideas is great. Um, you know, it, um, also may help us in the sense that maybe we can use some aspects of condensed matter physics to, you know, have a role in high energy physics. For example, so I know some people are, you know, I don't know how realistic it is, but some people are claiming maybe they can use different types of super energy systems to measure dark matter or things like that. There may be aspects of how the field theories, the fundamental field theories and the field theories in the material itself can interact in a way that might be useful for both fields, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, that statement that the world in gradient is, is what actually compelled me to do Kids matter physics instead of high energy physics. I never, when I was an undergraduate, I never wanted to even do um, uh, kids matter physics. I worked on a, an RU project on the fractal quantum Hall effect, and I was at the same time doing a reading course on quantum gravity. And I told my quantum gravity mentor, I said, "Oh yeah, I'm, not, I'm doing this boring project in kids matter physics." He said, "Oh, what are you working on?" I said, "Oh, I'm working on the fractal quantum Hall effect." And he said, "Well, if you think that's boring, you definitely don't need to go into kids matter physics, right?" And, um, you know, it wasn't until I think my eyes were opened to some interesting aspect, what I thought were more interesting aspects of condensed matter physics that, that kind of dragged me in this direction. So I think that using condensed matter as a tabletop proof of concept is really great. Um, and then um, for, you know, for lots of reasons, but also maybe it will actually eventually feed back to high energy physics in different directions, you know. Um, and, and the, other, the other benefit, I think, one other benefit, which I'll just briefly mention is that, you know, in condensed matter physics, for better or worse, we don't have Lorentz invariance, right? And so that means that the level of field theories, there's a lot, there's a lot of richer, there's a lot of rich territory that hasn't been explored. In fact, there's lots of recent work on these so-called fracton um, phases of matter, which are basically arising because of different lattice symmetries and non-relativistic physics, which wasn't necessarily done to death already in the high energy literature. So I think there's a lot of realms to explore that might, you know, help, you know, feedback between the two as well. So um, hopefully that was a coherent statement. <laughs> So on that wonderful note, linking condensed matter and a grain of sand and the universe, uh, it's, a, it's a good time to um, end the session. Just please remember that you can find the recording on YouTube um, under Aspen Physics. Taylor, thank you so much sure. for that for having me, yeah. beautiful uh, um, colloquium. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, everybody, for coming. I appreciate it.